next show will start in one minute. Liberal or conservative, male or female, young or old, Americans love to bash the news media. Once among the nation's most trusted institutions, the news media have fallen from grace. According to Gallup, even as recently as 2000, a majority of Americans trusted the press. By 2015, it had fallen to 40 percent, and lower than that, 36 percent among those 18 to 49. It's hard to see how this decline will be reversed. The industry has become politically polarized, and in the highly competitive age of multiple 24-hour cable news channels and the Internet, it's under severe financial pressure. And this compounds an even deeper problem, failing journalistic standards. In the 1950s, the media universe consisted mainly of a few national television broadcast networks and local TV and radio stations, most of which got much of their news from major wire services in the nation's large newspapers. Most journalists were committed to producing objective journalism, fact-based stories independent of the government and of political parties. A reporter's job was to report, not offer opinion or advocate. Presented with the facts, it was up to readers to make their own judgments about news events. Opinions were supposed to be confined to editorial and op-ed pages. That world no longer exists. This lack of objectivity and the decline of standards is one reason, though not the only one, why newspapers and news magazines are a declining industry. According to Pew Research, Print revenue from newspaper sales has declined from $47 billion in 2006 to $16 billion in 2014. Digital sales haven't come close to making up the difference. Most papers have been forced to cut operating expenses, slash staff, and close bureaus, overseas in particular. Ironically, there are more stories than ever to cover, and fewer staff than ever to cover them. This lack of information from professional journalists has been filled by a new source, social media and the blogosphere. When the Iraq War, which I covered for the New York Times, began in 2003, there were roughly 100,000 bloggers. Only a few years later, there were an estimated 27 million. The Internet, as a news source, has obvious pluses and minuses. On the plus side is that information is spread widely and instantly. The minuses have to do with the fact that the quality of reporting varies dramatically. It's not easy to separate the wheat from the chaff. Furthermore, many sites, including mainstream sites, have abandoned traditional journalistic practices and standards in search of more and more eyeballs. Objectivity, once the gold standard of reporting, is now often seen as old-fashioned a ratings loser. When success is measured mainly in terms of clicks, the outrageous beats the sober just about every time. Inserting opinion, even in the middle of a news story, is a way in which journalists can distinguish themselves, and in mainstream media outlets, those opinions overwhelmingly tend to be liberal. This might not be so bad if journalists acknowledge their bias, but they almost never do. Yet the bias is obvious. 
According to a 2014 study by two Indiana University professors, reporters who identify as Democrats outnumber those who identify as Republicans by 4 to 1, 28 percent to 7 percent. The remaining 65 percent call themselves independent, but based on my long experience as a reporter, this is a fiction. That is, many reporters like to describe themselves as independent, but they're not. Not really. By any fair measure, this group is overwhelmingly on the political left. The obvious liberal bias has only served to push conservative readers to those sources that cater to conservative themes, further polarizing the media landscape. And unable to attract conservatives, the mainstream media have chosen to double down on views and themes that appeal to their liberal constituency. To give just one example, when Fox News broke a story in January 2016 about the discovery of top-secret intelligence on the private email server that Hillary Clinton used while Secretary of State, classified information which she had denied ever having sent or received, the New York Times buried this news story deep inside the paper. A decline in reporting standards, a decline in revenue, an increase in bias have made many wary of the people who provide them with their news. A certain amount of skepticism is a healthy thing, but a thriving democracy depends on a dynamic and free press. As much as people may like to bash the media, most people would far prefer to trust it. I'm Judith Miller, contributing editor of City Journal for Prager University. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, click here. To help keep our videos free, donate here. Streaming live from the Paul and Catherine Ranke Memorial Studio, this is TV Free Baltimore. Support for TV Free Baltimore comes from viewers like you. Become a TV Free Baltimore member by visiting patreon.com slash TV Free Baltimore. As a public service, TV Free Baltimore provides a digital soapbox for those the mainstream media ignores. The opinions expressed in this live stream are not necessarily those of the owners, management, or underwriters of TV Free Baltimore. Furthermore, TV Free Baltimore streams hyper-local content focusing on politics and entertainment in the Baltimore viewing area. Hope you're enjoying your visit here this evening. Now, on with the show. Hello, I'm Paul Stefan, and this is another episode of TV Free Baltimore's Movie Reviews. And tonight, we have a, our guest is a filmmaker who, for over 30 years, he has done over 40 documentaries. His first film, and he's best known around the world, is for Heavy Metal Parking Lot. And he's done a lot of other things in between. We'll talk a little bit about those. But tonight we want to feature his latest film, which is called Led Zeppelin Played Here. And it's all about, did Led Zeppelin play a concert at the Wheaton Recreation Center in January 20th, 1969, or didn't they? And this movie will be screened next Saturday at 4 p.m. at the Nicaros Parkway Theater on North Avenue. And we want to welcome the filmmaker with us today, Jeff Krulik. Hi, Jeff. Hello there. <laughs> it's great to nice have to you. Nice to see you, Paul. Thank now you. Now, this movie, Led Zeppelin Played Here, where did that idea for that movie come from? Well, it's uh, something that really came out of um, an interest in the local culture, which I like to, you know, in the history of the mm -hmm. culture, the area that I'm from. And what I did was in, 19, in 2008, I got interested in the Laurel Pop Festival, which was a two-day pop festival at the Laurel Racetrack. 
uh, one month before Woodstock. And I started thinking, well, maybe there's a documentary here. I, like I said, I was interested in the local culture, the local music history culture. You know, there's a lot of things were um, something that I had just really uh, keyed in on. I thought this would make a good documentary. But I wanted to do something about that pop festival. And then um, Led Zeppelin headlined there the first night of it. And I ended up looking, you know, kind of going backwards, uh, tracing Led Zeppelin's uh, rise, if you will, as a rock band. And it turns out there was a story of them playing at the, uh, this modest uh, youth center um, called the Wheaton Youth Center mm -hmm. on Georgia Avenue in Wheaton, Maryland, uh, in front of only, you know maybe 50 teenagers, mm -hmm. and uh, on a on a snowy night that happened to right. be Richard Nixon's inauguration, right. nobody went and nobody believed the concert happened. Mm -hmm. My friend wrote a book. Mark Sosnick wrote a book called Capital Rock, and in that book, he talks about it because he interviews Barry Richards, who was the local DJ right. who put the concert on, and so. That's really what, where I first heard about the concert mm -hmm. and knew about it. But it wasn't until I walked into the Wheaton right. Youth Center. By then, it was called the Wheaton Recreation Center. Right, right. I, I walked in there, and the place was frozen in time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is really neat. This could make for a really neat <laughs> character in a film that might be a lot of talking heads otherwise. Right. So it really helped just... Uh, chart the, the course of what became the movie Led Zeppelin played here. And it's, it's, it's not about Led Zeppelin, totally. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they're a big part of it, uh, a big part of the story, but it kind of goes in a lot of other directions too. Right. Now, as, as people think it is a mystery. Like, did it happen or didn't it happen? So when you're putting together this film from day one, how did you go about trying to solve the mystery? I'm not even sure if I did. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if I really was trying to solve it per se. Um, I just kind of hoped it would come along, uh, you know, that I would take yeah. the audience along on this kind of interesting journey of uh, yeah. the local cultural history, local music history. Um, if it wasn't for some happy accidents, I'm not sure if I'd even have something where it would look like it's solved, you know, where you meet people who have something and they show you something and, you know, you can only do so much digging and right. you're on your own. You have right. to, you put your, put it out there, which is what we did. We got a lot of press, very favorable press, which was great because people got wind of it when I was starting the documentary in 2009. Mm -hmm. The Washington Post did a piece um, about what, a reunion that I was putting together that was going to be at the Wheaton Youth Center. Mm -hmm. And it was in March of 2009. Okay. And so around uh, January, around the time of President Obama's inauguration, in fact, so there was an inaugural hook. Again. Um, we went public with what became this uh, a new focus of the documentary, which was on um, this youth center. You know, I mean, I had hoped and I intended to have the Laurel Pop Festival included, and it is included in the film, mm -hmm. but I really turned my attention to uh, something else when I walked into that youth center and it was right. frozen in time and I thought, wow, how neat. So I conceived of the idea, I had the idea of having this reunion where people would come and be able to tell us, you know, um, basically, hopefully, firsthand oral history mm -hmm. of perhaps Led Zeppelin <laughs> and uh, being at this youth center, um, which very few people believed. Now, everybody came to the reunion. We had a huge turnout, over 200 people, lots of people who saw concerts at the youth center, mm -hmm. and um, nobody saw Led Zeppelin. <laughs> they saw the other bands, you know, Rod Stewart and Faces, the, the uh, um, Spirit, or, mm -hmm. you know, lots of, you know, so a lot of local bands played there. Um, there was a lot of bands you know, we're, we're playing there, Rare Earth, Dr. John. Nobody questions any of those national acts, but they always question Led Zeppelin. That's interesting. Now, you say at that reunion, nobody who came were actually there on January 20th, 1969. Right. Okay. Well, wait a second. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
we do have somebody who she's in the film. You'll see it. You got to go see the film. film. Yes, I but there uh, were a few so people. We, we, well, no, we we, we uh, yeah. I, I think I'm rewriting history in my head. You know, it's been okay. so long now. Well, you know, the, the because we did have some book. people. There were people there, not many. Yeah. And of course, what you want when you're doing something like this, you want yeah. people who can tell a good story and give you some great juicy details. That mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. We didn't have a lot of, but we had right. a lot to start and go on and work with. And it was a wonderful launching point to the film. Good. And it, we got just great stories. You'll see it in the yeah. film. We got great outtakes, <laughs> and we're going to put all those up on, oh, on YouTube, on online. Right. That's great. Now, I know it was interesting that you talked to the woman, I think, only by phone, who ran the, the center from 66 to 72, and she has no recollection of it happening. Right, and that's one of the fun parts of this because <laughs> there's a, a lot of people that you'd think would know about this, and they don't. Right. And and I, you know, and in fact, some people who said that yes, it did happen, and are very emphatic that it did happen, and I go and I'm talking on the phone to them, and then I go talk to them and interview them on film, which you'll see. Right. They don't remember it that way. You know, they don't remember certain things that, you know, and you hope that they could deliver the goods. But anyway, all this kind of just comes, put it into this kind of filmmaking stew and see what you can come up with. And, um, and in fact, if I hadn't have set a deadline for myself, I'd still be working on it now, you know, <laughs> to, uh, you, you have to, at least the way I work, I'm not sure if it's the right way or if, yeah. or if, uh, it's for everybody, but I have yeah. to set a, a set up a screening. Oftentimes, I set up a screening, mm -hmm. and um, and I don't have the film finished. Far from it, in fact. But I know I have to work on it to get it ready yeah. and finish it, or at least put it into some kind of you know viewable, uh, you know, nearly complete. Or yeah. you know, or, or enjoyable enough that people will stay in their seats for however <laughs> long <laughs> you make it. I, I haven't seen that first version we did in a long time. It would be interesting mm -hmm. to kind of look at it now, these many years later, because when we had the premiere, we had it on another inauguration weekend, mm -hmm. because that was kind of a, a hook. Was the inauguration two thousand nine? Well, this was 2013. Oh, 2013. President Obama's second His, inauguration. Second inauguration. You, you I mean, if it. we tried okay. to do something on, for, on President Obama's first inauguration, I don't think we would have gotten much ink. <laughs> no, I guess you know, not. Yeah, that wouldn't have gotten, we wouldn't have, we well, would have tr one, really gotten yeah. lost in the shuffle. It worked out perfectly with the second term and second inauguration, which still we were able to capitalize on the inaugural theme, right. and we were able to have a, a screening mm -hmm. the night before the inauguration, really just you know, playing up, you know, hey, this is kind of when it happened, or didn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. But we wanted to at least get a date that we could then screen um, uh, the film. Right. And, and we called it a preview screening. Ah, okay. That allowed us to then work with it from that point on. We stayed up all night. I mean, yeah. round the clock for days, at least three days. It felt like it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> you know? <laughs> But we were kind of locked in the edit, which talked to most, many filmmakers. I don't know if it's most, but feels like it's, I'll go ahead and say it. It's right. most filmmakers. When they're, you know, finishing their work, it usually is down to the wire. Mm -hmm. Whatever deadline is set. Right. Whether it's a film festival or a screening. Right. Sometimes films are never done, you know, you right. keep... Going around with something. Like if you had some definitive proof come through, you'd come out with a revised. <laughs> I don't know. Of the film. I, I don't know. I mean, people have somehow suggested yeah. that, and I'm not entirely sure. Oh, who knows? Come, bring the proof. I want. Let me have it. You know, exactly. bring, bring more of it. Bring people more, need to bring the proof. Yeah, well, yeah. What? I mean, yeah. look. Yeah. Well, the film. I'm so pleased that the film is is fun for an audience. Right. And um, because it, it's it's. You want it to, you know, capture people's attention, keep them interested, and stay with you. And I think the way the film evolved into this mystery, 
mm -hmm. has been really good mm -hmm. for the film. I'll tell you, one of my most interesting screenings was at the New Deal Cafe uh, in Greenbelt, Maryland. Okay. Um, we had a screening there, and uh, we had a lot of AV problems. Oh. And the film kept stopping and starting. At one point, there was like a half hour delay. Oh. Nobody left the entire wow. time. I mean, everybody was was yeah. was there. They loved it. That meant so much to me because I'm I'm just having the worst night of my life, at least with the film, you know. Yeah. And then turns into the best night. <laughs> Isn't that nice? When well, somebody finally fixed the all they had to do was turn the projector off and oh. turn it back on, <laughs> and that okay. fixed it. But that was really an interesting experience, and it also just kind of was a testament to me that people really enjoy watching this film and enjoy watching it with a group, you know, an audience. Right. And I love, love that. I love a right. chance to put something on the, on the screen. That's a real thrill. Well, it's good to say for a filmmaker, you're talking about a particular evening, to say, you know, here's some hard work I did, and people found something I created compelling, you know. Yeah, I, no, there's no better feeling, especially when you, you know, work so hard on something and you just are so burnt out on something. <laughs> you, you have a, it's a love-hate relationship with this stuff. Yeah. But really, I mean, I, that's what, you forget about all the, uh, yeah. the hard work that goes yeah. into making something right. when people do enjoy it. Well, it was great. You talk about, you don't know which way you want to have it because, for example, you said you had your, your anniversary in 2009. And hardly anybody showed up who claimed to have been there, whereas the opposite usually happens is that, Everybody who was a teenager in 1969 said they were at Woodstock. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. And obviously they weren't. Right. So right. you had it the other way. You're right. You're right. I mean, people came and talked about all sorts. Of, you know, it, that's what kind of, excuse me, was really uh, kind of, um, you know, just demonstrated how important that space was, that place was, the right. youth center. Yeah. Uh, and it meant a lot to so many people. And... You know, and it, it was just really fun to capture that. And so right. being able to kind of soak up that vibe that it wasn't necessary that everybody came and said they saw Led Zeppelin. Right. Um, but some people did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that was good. They, some people indeed were confirmed, yes, that Led Zeppelin did, right. did you know, play there. Something, though, there's just something, maybe it's the, the era we live in this, or this, the times we live in now, that people just want to have, you know, hard concrete proof. Yeah. You know, and I don't have that. Right. But I have a lot of convincing evidence. Yes. Now, bring that up. I mean, part of these films, and people have talked about, like, when you did your first film, Heavy Metal Parking Lot, you really weren't a big fan of Judas Priest. To say that you're more concerned, like you say, with pop culture, or what I thought was more interesting is the evolution of the concert industry. Now, let's say back then, maybe a lot of people today don't realize, very big bands, or at least through the history of rock now, and then Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, played things like rec centers, or there was a rec center circuit, or they played high school gyms and auditoriums, because in the film it talks about, oh, James Brown played at a high school. I mean, these kind of things, it just kind of blows you away, that it went from that, and tickets that were maybe a dollar or two, where today they're filling stadiums and big arenas, and you almost have to be at least upper middle class to get a ticket to a concert. Now it's not concerts for the people anymore. Right. But it's one and two hundred dollars a ticket. No. You know, like Billy Joel's coming to Memorial Stadium this summer. I mean, not Memorial Stadium, but Camden Yards, and uh, and that's probably yeah, expensive. Memorial <laughs> Stadium. Yeah. You know, um, that was uh, a slip of an old. Yeah, man. sure. Be okay. fun to uh, do it where Memorial Stadium was. Tribute yeah. to Memorial Stadium. Right. But. Yeah, I mean, it's... How it evolved, right. Right, I, I, that's why, like I said, the film's about other things yeah, besides exactly. Led Zeppelin playing. It's, it's really, and that's what I intended. I mean, the people who you for. interview then uh, can look back and look what a point I'm making to say, boy, we were lucky to see these bands that if we'd saw them today or when they're doing a, re you know, a revival tour, we couldn't afford to see them? Well, I think it's just, again, part of the, you know, it's the time and place and the, this, the days, time, where we, the time we live in now. I mean, look at, look at you know, the, the, the media landscape, you know, like you, we right. saw on the, yeah, yeah. on the lead into to the right. program right. here. I mean, it's all different, you know, and so the, you know, concert going, mm -hmm. I mean, even rock and roll was still a new, a new thing as we know it today, right. you know, you know, at the time, you know, the, the album rock, 
Right. It was coming at the, you know, Vogue, um, I don't know, the uh, rock band. I mean, it just, yeah. it was the first decade of right. the emergence of now a culture and a, you know, uh -huh. and, and that's ingrained and in just a part of our DNA almost. And at least regarding the concert industry, yes, it's yeah. completely different. And I don't know, I've always just had a fascination with that. And I think it's the kind of the frustrated promoter in me. <laughs> I've always, I did want to work in that, oh, you did. that you world. Did. And I, did. I realized I, I didn't have the, uh, you know, the backbone to be a promoter. I mean, and, you know, I just, I mean, I, so I think um, that kind of, along with other things, it just, yeah. and interests, personal interests, I, you know, started to, uh, you know, pro do projects around my interest in concert history. Mm -hmm. Because I've done other things, but not just documentaries about it. I've put together, you know, panel discussions and mm -hmm. events celebrating, you know, different um, places and moments. Like uh, I did the Ambassador Theater reunion in Washington, D.C. I put it together. It was at a nightclub, Songbird, that was, mm -hmm. it's in Adams Morgan. I, mean, I don't want to stray too far, no. you know, off the rails here, but that was a, uh, a, a event to uh, celebrate yeah. uh, Washington, D.C. psychedelic dance hall where Jimi Hendrix, wow. you know, Great. debuted in Washington, his first um, appearance. Nobody knew who he was. Well, Just like Led Zeppelin. <laughs> Nobody knew who Led who Zeppelin they were. was. Right. Yeah. Right. So okay. all that stuff fascinates me. <laughs> yeah. And um, that's kind of why um, the film, I think, became what it did. And some people thought, yeah. well, sorry, I didn't mean to <laughs> right. yell into the microphone. Some people okay. thought that the film, you know, it should be shorter. Yeah. And, you know, on the surface, yeah, maybe. But that's why there's so much more into it. And, of course, yeah. I was able to work in the Laurel Pop Festival. And different things. I mean, uh, I think something to bring up, too, is somebody in your film said they think that, concert industry changed after Woodstock, that right. same summer. Right. You know, that this, the bands that were getting five and 10,000 were then were asking 100,000. Well, I think in this case, at least yeah. with regard to Woodstock, I mean, I think yeah. that might have been, I mean, yeah, I, I, mean, I wasn't there. I mean, yeah. I was eight, you know, yeah. right. <laughs> when this thing <laughs> took place, but um, uh, when the concert in 69 took place. But I, I think, it, yeah, it was really after Woodstock. Because I was thinking in my head, and I was after the movie, but a year uh, later. But no, it was after Woodstock. I would imagine that's yeah. when the bands were indeed, you know, all of a sudden, you know, and the, and the business people were involved and the, right. the money people, and it, it became, became a business. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we have now today, and everybody takes it for granted, or, or not even or takes it for granted that this is the way it is. Right. They in don't fact, question it. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, or they don't go yeah. <laughs> to, to concerts. Yeah. For, well, I think being a D.C. area guy, you say a good example of that, is they had the little club called Cellar Door, but then it became Cellar Door Productions, you know, and so they did. They got bigger. With exactly. They realized concerts. they realized there was a, there was a, a model that they kind of they maybe were part of the invention of that, you know, yeah. because they were putting acts in their club, and you know, at some point they realized they could get you know, the same amount of people into an auditorium one night and right. you know there's just it was a convergence money, of a lot of, of things for more money for everybody mm -hmm. so that's what was kind of going on right. and cellar door of course uh yeah. you know became huge as a concert promoter mm -hmm. uh locations you know they kind of grab when someplace like the capitol center mm -hmm. uh, opened well even prior to that you had the civic center the baltimore civic center right was where the concerts were taking place that, um, in fact, Led Zeppelin played there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that was... Um, the Beatles played there. Did yes, it? they did. <laughs> Rolling Stones. <laughs> yes, all yeah. of them. Yeah, everybody. That was a concert, a, a, play, a stop on the concert circuit. Right. And uh, so, but when, Cellar Door, when the Capitol Center opened, you know, I think that's where they were able to... You know, they had the giant telescreen, and uh, it was a little, maybe, um, you know, it was, you know, this, the Civic Center was still for the Baltimore market, but right. the Civic Capital Center might have been a nicer building right. at that moment in time. And mm -hmm. so, and the promoters went there, more people, mm -hmm. 
make more money. Of course. And uh, Cellar Door got the contract. You know, they actually, with the owner of the Capital Center, Abe Poland, I mean, right. my understanding and is that Cellar Door had the, the lock on the concerts. I mean, if you wanted to do a concert there, other promoters did. You had to go right. through Cellar Door and work with them. Um, but anyway, that is at that point, right then, it's, you know, it's, it's business model. You know, and, you, and also, I mean, it was less fly-by-night, clearly. Right. And places like the fire halls you mentioned or the youth centers, mm -hmm. roller rinks, the Alexandria Roller Rink, for instance, was a I location for a lot of concerts. Wow. Right, okay. right. Um, that's, those, those days ended. Right. You know, and then you had venues like the Kennedy Center experimenting with it. And that was... Right. And that's in your film. Right, exactly. I wanted to be able to show that this was happening for people that... Right. Can't believe it. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it still goes on now. I think certain places still have, like, the Lyric, don't they have? That, that's an opera house. I mean, it's in the old opera I'll, house in Baltimore. Yeah, I mean, they've I but, mean, I saw a few years I ago. Didn't, were they, yeah. I think there was a band at the Hippodrome. Pardon? I was going to say a few yeah. years ago, I was going to say they do still do stuff like that sometimes. I saw Nora Jones there, you know, even though she's not rock, right. hard rock. Right. She was, you know. I think the band Kansas just played. Really? Yeah, yeah they may have. Yeah, but I'm not sure. I'm, I, I, somebody get out their phone. You can find it in a yeah. second. Yeah, well, now your first film, ah. Heavy Metal Parking Lot. Sure. Which you, the film was really about the people, you know, out on the, in the parking lot. It was about the fans, right. Not right. about the Judas Priest concert. Correct. And it was about the fans, and it's almost like, you know, with football games, it's almost like a tailgate party, people drinking and eating and doing stuff before they went into the concert. And it was like that. Now, was that unique? Has anybody ever, did anybody ever do a parking lot type movie before you guys did it? Um, you'd think I'd know this off the top of my head. Yeah, I mean, yes, yes. There had been. There had been. Well, I mean, not really. Uh, I mean, there'd been fan films. Yeah. I mean, but, but probably not just like the way we did it. Right. And nothing's coming, you know. I got you. Help me, audience, yes. people out there, <laughs> yes, send I'm in to email in if you have right. any. Uh, Please do. Fact, <laughs> if anything's inaccurate here. But um, I'm just wondering, because yeah, it seems unique to the time. Well, it was. And that's why there's still this currency with that. Because Why was it such a cult hit, do you think? Oh boy! Well, or is still a cult. It's hit. still a cult, and it's still under the radar screen. <laughs> Go up and down the street here and ask people if they've heard they of it. Never, but they, say no. They'd say no, right? You but know, the, you know, in a sense, you know, why do you think it became such a cult classic and imitated? Well, um, it just was part of the time when it was a short for anybody that might not know. And that what we're talking about, mm -hmm. it's this film, Heavy Metal Parking Lot. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's uh, mm -hmm. um, heavy metal fans right. in a parking lot. In this case, the parking lot of the Capitol Center, which we were just talking about. Right, exactly. You know, um, mm -hmm. getting revved up and, and uh, you know, fired up for the concert they were seeing that night. And it was Judas yeah. Priest, right. a popular heavy metal band. And if yeah. not, you know, now the iconic heavy metal band. Mm -hmm. um, Along with you know, others they're right. they're right at the, you know the top the pinnacle. Right. But I mean, it could have been anybody when we did this. We just showed up. We happened to pick this nice warm spring Saturday, mm -hmm. and I'm, when I say we, I'm talking about John Hine, who at this right. point we were, we became fast friends. We had met maybe uh, two years earlier, or a year earlier. Excuse yeah. me. We met like in 1985. Mm -hmm. And by, you know, we started collaborating. We had similar interests, film interests. We mm -hmm. wanted to make films. We wanted to make documentaries. Mm -hmm. I had access to camera gear. That's very important here because yes. I, was, I worked in public access, which is community television. Mm -hmm. And I was actually, you know, at age 25, I was in charge of the studio. Wow. <laughs> You're already an executive. You made yes. It. <laughs> My staff was two people, three at its peak. Okay. But it was still... Um, an interesting thing. I, I think I, I kind of brought a sensibility that I had est maybe established in, um, uh, in college radio. I went to University of Maryland. I will, you know, say that I'm I'm a homer. I grow I grew up yeah. in Bowie, Maryland, 
And I went to school in College Park at the University of Maryland. Okay. And then I've, I've never left. I yeah. stayed here and okay. was able to, you know, build a, a body of work and, of course, you know, get into yeah. filmmaking and, and video making. I mean, I've right. never touched a film in my life, you know, for, um, you know, it's funny because when I was starting out, there were very clear distinctions. If you worked in video, you couldn't call yourself a filmmaker mm -hmm. and you were a video maker. And then film festivals would not take video. Wow. You had to, I mean, very few opportunities to right. screen work in a theater, theatrical, in a theater like setting. Yeah. And that's again why it, this goes back into your um, uh, question about why it became a cult. Uh, this was pre viral video as we know it today. Right. Clearly, you know, the way you can just. Yeah. bring something up in a seconds um you know back then you had to do tape trading and again all we had were tapes this was shot on video if we couldn't get into film Festival. to festivals and we couldn't get into theaters right. to screen this on the screen we had to you know give it to people to watch on their vcrs at home right and um that's pretty much how it was spread around and taped there was a real strong um, fan network, um, you know, of tape trading, right. music-related tape trading, and that's it. Kind of got into that okay. circuit, and but it also just you know it was hey, I, I don't know, we we just were very fortunate that again John Hine and I brought these. I had access to the cameras. Mm -hmm. If I didn't have, a, I had these big clunky professional video cameras, right. three quarter inch video, mm -hmm. which is the size of a book. You know, you have 20 minute tapes, mm -hmm. you're carrying around a deck that's like 50 pounds and the camera, I don't know, 50, that's heavy. Yeah. I'll say 20, Okay. 25, whatever, 20, 20 pound camera. Right. I mean, no deck, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the camera's big and bulky. But we look like a news crew. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but it was John's idea. I give him full credit for coming in to me. I said right away, let's do it. Because again, we, we were really interested in kind of you know, subcultures or just right. interest, you know, what's going on out in the margins. This is why John and I clicked so well. Right. John had been a, a, a production assistant on Polyester, one of John Waters' right. films. Right. John was, uh, loved old movie theaters. Mm -hmm as did I, and we both had done separate projects about old movie theaters, and that's how we first met. But we really clicked and shared a lot of the same sensibilities. Perfect. And so, so John had the idea, I had the equipment, and it mm -hmm. seemed like a no-brainer because the, the studio was really close to mm -hmm. the Capitol Center where the concert was. Right. And, it, and, and I, I will say, John and I were not heavy metal fans. I mean, we, right. we were never dismissive of it. Right. We were interested in it. We were curious about mm -hmm. um, what was going on. And we would, we'd gone to concerts ourselves. We knew the parking lot was always a lively place, regardless of, what, of who was playing. Right. But also, this was the time, the era of um, you know, uh, heavy hair metal and mm -hmm. big just big You hair. saw metal. Excuse me, mid-80s, this was 1986. Metal was, um, it might not have been on the top 40, but it was, it was shown on MTV, it was played on the radio. There were plenty of fans and enough fans mm -hmm. that a, a band like Judas Priest could headline mm -hmm. and, and you know, get a lot of people to, out to see them in a concert setting. And right. so that, anyway, I'm, I'm kind of pinballing around here. Yeah, I'm so gonna the biggest, wanna... I mean, I'm going to say right now, the biggest, I was going to bring it up, you just mentioned it, but I, in my mind I was saying that do you think your film was helped by the fact that you were a few years into the MTV generation? Well, I, I, well, I think it was just more the video generation, the, okay. the ease of being able to videotape, VHS, yeah. okay. tape trading. Right. Because there also was, there was plenty of tape trading, cassette tape trading, right. music, music tape trading. Mm -hmm. um, when that was, a, you know, when, oh. which was concurrent with, you know, with VHS, videotape trading but it yeah. wasn't everybody I mean you had to be kind of a collector I guess right um, I used to sh but I would have screening parties in my living room yeah. what's that 
<laughs> Don't that, worry, it yeah, means okay. we're running out of time. Oh, running out of time? <laughs> That's terrible. I was going to say to you then to get into a few quick yeah, things. Yeah, please. Don't, I, can, I will talk Just a, a few quick street. things, which was, uh, you know, it said it initially when this became a big hit. You really, or maybe later, you wanted to be more recognized for other documentaries you've done as opposed to heavy metal parking lot. Did I say that? I think you said that, but if you didn't... <laughs> no, well, no, 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 I'm no, kidding. We'll I, I, no, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll address that. Um, and uh, I'm very proud of all my work. I'm very proud of all my projects, my films. You very kindly said that I made 40 documentaries. I'm not going to dispute that, but most of them are shorts. Yeah. Most of them are short. I mean, still documentary. Well, sure. No, I appreciate that, and I, th that's true, but um, it's easier to make short films than... Yeah. Longer ones. Than and now your style. Film. I mean, I'm gonna have to move quick here. Well, it, is, your documentary style. A lot of people say he's different in that it says he lets his characters breathe, he lets scenes play out, and he doesn't shape a narrative. You know? Oh, that's nice. Who's is that I, true? I, well, sure. Thank you, whoever wrote that. Because <laughs> other know? people say they take the footage and they shape a narrative. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, anytime you turn a camera on and shape somebody, you're you know it's a manipulation you know of, yeah. of what's happening it's not something happening without a camera yeah I mean I, but I'm always I love I just love eccentricity I love interesting mm -hmm. kinds of cat behavior I love material that will look good and work with right. me on will be good content right. on True. video um, and yeah but I also like like in Led Zeppelin played here I mean there's a lot of times you you know I'm in I'm in the shot or I'm yeah. I'm, I'm I'm screwing up you know or I'm making um, I, I you know I like you know showing you know what's behind the curtain right. and some of that's my own limitations oh. but also you know something that I like to kind of playfully yeah. work in the yeah. but I kind of learned that I mean like going back, heavy metal parking lot we didn't know what we were we knew we wanted to be filmmakers yeah. and we we were. Filmmakers, yeah, we, were we were emerging filmmakers, yeah. but um, I got to tell you, the reason that film, um, uh, the film works, is because of the people in it. They're right. the stars, you know. They are. They really deserve as much, if not more, credit for making that that film what it is. Now I want to ask you to tell people, look in the camera there, and tell them how they can find these films. So I think some of them exist on YouTube, for example. And the best way, you know, what your contact information is, and if they want to find out about next Saturday's film, let them know how to find out all about the Jeff Krulik films and all about Jeff Krulik. Wow, thanks again. Please. It's so nice to be Tell them. <laughs> you know, um, what, well, everything, a lot, most, is online. You know, along with 10 billion other things out there. <laughs> you know, along with TV, you know, free Baltimore, you know. But I do have websites, you know, jeffkrulik.com. There's heavymetalparkinglot.com. There's Led, Ze Led Zeppelin played here.com. And a lot of my work is on YouTube and some on Vimeo. And, um, you know, if you just, if you want to see Heavy Metal Parking Lot, you can just search for that. And um, a lot of my other titles, you know, I may, you might want to go to my my web my website jeffkrulik.com, which will then take you to the specific uh, YouTube and related channels for them. Because um, that's because I have stuff all over the place, you well, know. Terrific, people can yeah. go look. But I really do appreciate the chance to talk about Led Zeppelin played here because this is the 50th anniversary year right. of when these concerts are happening that are in the film terrific. because. Next Saturday, February 16th, is the screening in Baltimore. And that is do on that day because that's the 50th anniversary of when Led Zeppelin had their first appearance in Baltimore. Wow. At the Baltimore Civic Center. Terrific. So that at, right when the film is screening at the Parkway Theater yeah. 50 years earlier, Led Zeppelin, who were actually on a multi-band bill. They were opening up for Vanilla Fudge yes. and Paul Butterfield Blues Band on a five-band bill at the Baltimore Civic Center. Wow. And it's, we were inviting, we hope people come out who were there yeah. who can share Terrific. stories about being at that concert. Who, for people who don't know, that is today the Royal Farms Arena. 
It's still there, and we still have musical acts there. But we want to thank you for being with us tonight, Jeff. Well, I know we could go on a few more hours, but we have other shows to get okay. to tonight. <laughs> sure. And so thanks a lot. Get the hook. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank <laughs> you very much for having You're me You're welcome. Here. And so, folks, it's the end of another one of our episodes, an interesting episode. I want you to see that film. Go to, and see it. There it is. Look, Led Zeppelin played here. And uh, until next time, uh, this is Paul Stefan, and please uh, keep watching. We hope you're enjoying your visit here this evening. Now, on with the show. This is Sam with Restore Computer Repair in Baltimore, Maryland. If you're having any computer problems whatsoever with your Mac or PC, desktop or laptop, we can fix it at a guaranteed lowest price. We're located at 8701 Harford Road in Parkville, Maryland, 21234. You can reach us at 443-725-5050. That's 443-725-5050. We're open Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., and Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. You can reach us at www.RestoreComputerRepair.com. Good evening. A year ago, TV Free Baltimore began live streaming. So what I thought I would do for you this evening is to put together a highlight reel of some of the things that we've done in the past year. Some really good stuff here. We've had some very interesting and enjoyable people in the studio. So enjoy. I'm going to answer an email which reads, Why did you start TV Free Baltimore? One reason is for an experience I have on almost a daily basis. While at work, I listen to NPR stations 88.1, 88.5, and 88.9. When I arrive home, I'll surf through our local news channels 2, 11, 13, and 45. Often, our local news outlets run the same stories in the same sequence with the same narrative and sometimes with the identical visuals. It appears our local news outlets mirror one another instead of standing alone as independent sources of information. So to answer the question, why did you start TV Free Baltimore, we did so to provide a digital soapbox for those the mainstream media ignores, and to provide information the media will not bring to light. Is Baltimore County becoming the new Baltimore City? Let's take a look at some stats on the internet. Now the last live stream I showed you, I showed you this website, How Money Walks, okay? And it shows how people essentially vote with their feet and leave jurisdictions because of tax policy. So let's go into their interactive map. And you can see here that Maryland is a red state, meaning that people are leaving Maryland for the states in green or pink because of the tax policies of the state. But let's leave the state for another time. Let's look at Baltimore County. Okay, Baltimore County lost $2.63 billion in annual adjusted gross income. That means the county has lost wealth. Okay, people have taken, have taken their tax dollars and fled to another state. Now, if you look at the population mode, like we did last week, you can see that Baltimore County gained a little over 11,000 people. So, the piece you really need to pay attention to is right here. 70,000, over 70,000 people came into Baltimore County from Baltimore City. But yet the county only gained um, 11,000 new residents. So, so let's bring our calculator out and... Um, so we had 70,000 people 
move in from Baltimore City, but yet only an increase of 11,000 in population. So that meant during the same 25-year period, 59,000 people left, okay? And the people that left were, for the most part, middle class. The people that are moving in from Baltimore City are, for the most part, poor. As you can see, Baltimore County lost $2.63 billion in annual adjusted gross income. So Baltimore County is becoming poor, just like Baltimore City. Now, another website I found is United States Census Bureau, American Fact Finder. So you go here and you type in Baltimore County. Hit the go button. And let's go down here to poverty. Poverty stats in the last 12 months. Okay, 2016. Let's bring it up here. In 2016, right there, the estimated percentage that lived below the poverty line is 9.3% in 2016. Let's go down to 2012. 8.5. That means there's been an increase in Baltimore County from 2012 into 2016 in those that live under the poverty line. So again, this is another indication that wealth is fleeing Baltimore County and that the county is becoming poor. So let's go back and look at a few other things. Now, housing. One of the things that um, people talk about a lot about Baltimore City is the vacant houses. So let's see if Baltimore County has vacant houses. So we come down here, 2016, vacant housing units, 24,000, let me bring it up a little bit more, 24,205 vacant housing units in Baltimore County. Now again, let's go back to 2012 so we stay in the same time frame and see how many vacant housing units there were in 2012. There were only 20,465. So we see that vacant houses are increasing in Baltimore County, just like Baltimore City. And why is this important to you if you live in Baltimore County? Why, why should you be aware of all this? Because our current county executive Kevin Cabinets, which is going to run for governor, he entered into secret proceedings with the NAACP, HUD, and others to bring more poverty into Baltimore County. Um, and I want to show you how the mainstream media covered this, and we're going to go to the sun. This is how they covered this whole situation. Baltimore County to curb housing segregation. And if you watch this video, they basically say that this poor black woman that happens to be crippled can't live where she wants to because of a lack of handicap uh, wheelchair ramps. And then if you go down here, and, and this is a perfect example of why fewer and fewer people are le reading the Baltimore Sun, because um, they're not telling you the facts. They're spinning the facts in order to push a political agenda. Um, so we're going to highlight these words right here. Then let me read the, the first sentence for you. Baltimore County officials announced plans Tuesday to bring to begin dismantling decades of discriminatory housing policies and the segregation they have wrought. Really? Are you claiming that Baltimore County is segregated? <laughs> oh my God, what a joke. Anyway, let's go to the official Baltimore County website. And look at population by race. In 2000, the white population made up just under 75% of the population. Blacks were a little bit more than 20%. Asians were a little bit more than 3.2%. Now, fast forward 10 years later, the white population has decreased to just under 65%. The black population has increased and the Asian population has increased. These trends are not the trends of a segregated political jurisdiction. This is just a complete idiocy. It's, it's, it's a fairy tale. 
to claim that Baltimore County is some sort of a segregated political jurisdiction. Now, here's something else that you need to pay attention to because um, right here. The county is to spend $30 million over the next decade. And what he excludes here is $30 million of Baltimore County's taxpayers' dollars that we're giving to the county to entice developers to build 1,000 homes for low-income African-American families. Why are they going to discriminate against poor white American families or poor Asian American families? That, that's racist. And then they're going to move these thousand units into prosperous county neighborhoods like Towson. Um, this article also says the county also pledged to help 2,000 families on Section 8 rent subsidies to move from poor, predominantly African-American communities, meaning Baltimore City, to better neighborhoods with stronger schools, lower crime, and minimal clusters of subsidized homes. Okay, let's scroll down here because there's something you really have to pay attention to. The Assistant Secretary of U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for Fair Housing called the work by advocates, county officials, and the federal government to craft a deal that can achieve clearly stated goals that this agency can monitor unprecedented. That's the word you have to pay attention to. Let me show you something. After each TV-free live stream, I'll boost the stream on Facebook for a week. After the stream of May the 19th, 2018 completed its week-long boost, it suddenly became not approved for any additional boosting. When you view the details, it states, not authorized for ads with political content. Here's what to do. Complete the authorization process. Facebook states, we're forcing people who want to run ads containing political content in the United States to confirm their identity. You need to provide your address, a photo ID, and the last four digits of your social security number to confirm your identity. In my opinion, this is completely anti-American, anti-free speech, and a form of intimidation. The First Amendment to our Constitution states, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Some are trying to sell us on this idea of private corporations like Facebook and Google are somehow not governed by the First Amendment since they are privately owned businesses. I'll argue otherwise. We have the written law, but there's also the spirit of the law and the political culture born of this idea of freedom particularly freedom of speech. Now, our founding fathers made it clear political speech is the gold standard of free speech and should be protected at all costs. However, it's become obvious that Facebook and Google are trying to take our culture off this long-established gold standard, arguing that as private corporations, they and they alone get to decide who can post political speech and what political speech can be posted. And in Facebook's case, you must now identify yourself with your address, a picture ID, and the last four digits of your social security number. If you want to become authorized for ads with political content, whatever that means. Now, Facebook and Google were one of a thousand social media sites which provided platforms for political speech. This would be no big deal. However, it needs to be recognized Facebook and Google share a near monopoly of the digital platform where political speech is most exercised in our modern society. Therefore, these two private corporations should be looked upon somewhat as public utilities and held to be not above the law, particularly the very first amendment of our Constitution. Furthermore, 
No one should believe that somehow Facebook and Google can simply disregard our long-established culture, which recognizes every individual's right to step onto a soapbox and freely speak about politics, whether the soapbox be a physical soapbox or a digital soapbox. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'm Don Wells, and guess what? You are watching TV Free Baltimore. Hey there, folks. This is Lenny Rudo from Fish Talk Magazine, and you're watching TV Free Baltimore. Guys, we were in a car crash. No one was hurt, but due to the accident, TV Free's live stream for May the 5th had to be canceled. Here's the story. We traveled to Hagerstown to cover the Maryland International Film Festival on Friday, April the 27th, and had a great time at the event. As we traveled back towards Baltimore on Route 70 at about 2 a.m. in the morning, a deer jumped out in front of the car. As we collided with the deer, we were traveling at about 70 miles an hour. Now again, we were not hurt, but the car obviously needs to be repaired. With that said, the local deer population must be increasing as the number of deer carcasses on the side of 695, 95, and 70 appears to be increasing, which leads one to believe there's an increasing number of people colliding with deer. However, the local media doesn't seem to be warning us about this dangerous situation, and I wonder why. Well, one could argue the mainstream media's anti-gun agenda doesn't allow stories about hunting deer particularly with guns. Showing hunters in a positive light would show guns in a positive light, which undermines the mainstream media's anti-Second Amendment stance. One can also argue the local media's reporting could lead a Martian to think Maryland is a landlocked state. You very rarely see local media covering stories about hunting, fishing, camping, or other outdoor activities. Despite the fact we have the Atlantic Ocean, the Chesapeake Bay, and so many other great outdoor areas. There was a time when WMAR featured Bill Burton, who would stand in front of a green screen like a weatherman and discuss the hot spots to fish. We here at TV Free Baltimore want to bring this type of local programming back. Maryland's outdoors should be celebrated and explored. Welcome to TV Free Baltimore's Books and Authors. Hello, and welcome to a special edition of Books and Authors. Today, our guest has spent 20 years in public service here in the state of Maryland, but we are interviewing him in his role as an author. He has written three previous books, Turn This Car Around, America, Hope for Change, and Turning Point. He has a fourth book coming out in just a couple of weeks. We are talking about and talking with today former Maryland Governor Robert Ehrlich. What I want to go into is some of the themes that you bring up, you know, in your, in your books. And the first one, I think, is you talk about a conservative common values majority. And what do you mean by that term? Yeah. Um... How much time do we have? <laughs> All right, <laughs> briefly. Jazz music is improvised, so it's built on the artist who can play jazz. Factory holes, pulling a heavy cart of words around, keeping my eyes north on that guiding star, dreaming in his bed while he plays and sings with me in his head. And I spent a whole night sleeping, I 
picking up the lock of this mystery Forgive me, I've lost my key Good evening. Uh, my name is Spencer Horseman. I am the uh, owner-operator of Illusions Magic Bar and Theater, located here in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, we've been open now for 11 years. Uh, originally, when my father and I started this, it was his magic store uh, for 20 years, called the uh, Yogi Magic Mart. After I graduated high school, we decided to uh, team up as business partners and create a magic theme bar and theater that we now feature uh, my hour and a half, two hour comedy magic shows every Friday and Saturday year round. Hey guys, Johnny Alonzo and you're watching TV Free Baltimore. Hello everybody, this is Paul Stefan and I'm here tonight at the Peel Museum with David London a man of many talents that we'll talk about tonight. Let's talk about The Night Watchman. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Was that the first real project you two guys worked together where well, you had total control or close to total control? It's no. not the first project that we've done where we've had total control. It's the first feature film that oh, we've done feature. together. Okay. That we've done together. together. Oh, you've done together. Yeah. Right. Yes. yeah, I mean, he's produced feature films on his own, and I've done other projects on my own. Right. So, But this is the first one we've done feature film together. Yeah, yeah because and you've done all kinds of things behind the camera, too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Editing, usually not good director, stuff director, producer. Yes. <laughs> not I'm usually not good stuff. Okay. <laughs> now, because our show is featured for, you know, Maryland people, mostly mm -hmm. in the Maryland audiences, I hate to start there, but we're going to start with uh, you working on Weird Maryland. <laughs> Don't hate to start there. It was one of the best, most fun projects I, uh, I had a chance to work on. Good evening, TV Free viewers. We are here again, ready once again to dive into Live in Annapolis with Delegate Lauren Aragon. And how you doing, Lauren? Good, good to be here. Are, are they uh, making the job tough for you down there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, um, let's start with something that I, that I received from the Maryland Taxpayers Association. And um, in their newsletter this week, they sent out uh, quite a lot of good information, but this section is called Your Pocketbooks, and this has to do with tax bills. Um, yeah. Now, the committee that, that you're in, do you see tax bills, or do they go to uh, No, they committee? pretty much all go to ways and means, I think. Ways um, and means. Sometimes maybe finance or... Uh, I don't know where they go on the on the house side. So they get all mixed up sometimes. I think they go wherever the speaker wants them to go, depending on how much he wants them to pass. <laughs> right, right, right. And maybe we can uh, talk uh, about that a little later. But let's talk about um, uh, standard deduction on personal income, House Bill 271 and House Bill 450. Yeah. And, and I think that um, you and I talked, touched on this last week about House Bill 327, which allows itemized deductions without itemizing federal returns. Yeah, now, that's was, great. Well, was this what you were talking about last yeah. week? And is this what the governor's um, trying to push and the Democrats aren't buying into? Right. Yeah, because it would it would mean that the state would have like a huge decrease in uh, in income from taxes if we allow people to itemize their state tax form and no one is going to be itemizing their federal tax form anymore. So, um, and right now they're coupled, so you, you can only do one or the other. So if nobody is doing the federal one, then, um, nobody would be able to do the state one either. So this would allow them to, to still do that, which would majorly cut down on, on their tax taxes for the state. 
So, so basically, at this point, it's Maryland that gets the windfall from the Trump administration changing the federal laws. Exactly. So the state gets it, but the individuals don't. Right. Hogan wants we, the taxpayers, to keep our money, and the Democrats in Annapolis, they want to keep it. Is that basically what's going on? Exactly. Okay. Well, and let's... Um, um, and, th and this goes back to what we were talking about last week, about people voting with their feet and leaving the state because of the tax policies of the state of Maryland. I mean, it just yeah. it boggles my mind that those in charge don't get it. Oh, I know. It's scary. It's really scary. Yeah, um, they just want to take as much as they can and redistribute it on whatever pet projects they have this year. Okay, let's let's go back. And and um, before I go back to the Maryland Taxpayers Association, what they sent out this week, or a little chunk of it, I, I do want to uh, send a big shout out to D. Hodges, the Maryland Taxpayers Association. If you want to receive their newsletter, you can just Google Maryland Taxpayers Association. You can sign up for their newsletter. A lot of great information in, in that. And I have reached out to D. Hodges to try to get her in again. We had her in about a year ago. Yeah. And she was the one that, uh, for me, for the first time, talked about nesting delegates within senatorial districts and also the fact that Maryland has both an inheritance tax and a um, basically basically a death tax. So yeah. if, if you have parents that pass away, you get taxed twice, which is um, which makes which is going to make it hard for some people to um, stay in the houses that they may have grown up in after their yeah. parents pass. I mean, yeah. Mm, disrupting people's lives. So anyway, uh, let's get back to this, what the Maryland Taxpayers Association sent out. And let's talk about uh, <laughs> corporate tax rate, six and six and a quarter from eight and a quarter by half yeah. percent annually. Now, is this something that the governor is supportive of? Uh, I can't remember who sponsored that one. There's so many tax bills going around. So cutting corporate tax rate to six and a half. I think I may have put my name on that one. I'm not sure if that is the governor's bill or if that's just, um, you know, a collection of Republicans who are working on that. But, you know, a lot of people think, and I even had some Democrats say, oh, Lauren, why did you put your name on cutting corporate taxes? Cor corporations are full of millionaires. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, you guys really don't understand how... Uh, how uh, corporations actually work. Anybody can have a can have a corporation. It doesn't have to make any money at all. Yeah, so, and, and a lot of small businesses are corporated. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I remember uh, years ago when I was investing in real estate, a lot of people yeah. were forming corporations, LLCs, and that sort of thing. And then suddenly mm -hmm. when O'Malley was down in the state house, I think it was uh, his administration that said, oh, well, Let's charge corporations seventy five dollars a year annually for just incorporating. Yeah, you know, that, crazy. Yeah, um, and also let, let's talk about how mechanically things work in Annapolis because I think that a lot of people believe that okay, I've elected Lauren down to the House of Delegates, and when you see the House of Delegates or the State Senate on TV, it's the whole body. They very rarely show the committees. So I think people right. are, a lot, are under the impression that you read each and every bill that is introduced and that the voting actually takes place just in the body as a whole. And right. the way it really works is that you are assigned a committee and then yeah. the bills are assigned to the committees by whom? The speaker. Okay, so the Speaker of the House of Delegates says, okay, I'm going to send, for example, House Bill uh, 361 to such and such committee. Now, here's where you get into the politics, and people need to understand this, and particularly when it comes to uh, gun legislation. There are certain committees that generally hear certain bills. You know, uh, you know the, the budget bills are going to go to the budget committee and other bills will go to other committees. Mm -hmm. And, but the speaker has the power to take a bill that would otherwise not be heard by a certain committee and put it in a certain committee if the speaker wants the bill to die or to come out of committee, correct? That's exactly right, that's exactly right. 
And then when the bill gets to the committee, they have a thing that's called, um, at least in my mind, it's called um, like professional respect. You respect the work that your colleagues are doing in their committee. So generally speaking, when a bill comes to the full body, it's basically rubber stamped unless it's some sort of controversial bill like gun control or something like that. Correct? Right. That's true. Yeah. So what you've seen so far down there, um, these tax cut bills, is the speaker sending them to favorable committees? Is he just following the standard procedures or is he placing them in committees where they know they will die? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure that he really knows right now based off of all the new people or maybe he, maybe he does know, maybe he has really good background and all the new guys, but um, it's hard for me to get a good read on what his motivations are. I know in the past, if you sent bills to, for example, Bobby Zirkin's, um, Senator Zirkin's committee, you could be pretty assured that if it was going to be super controversial, um, far left or far right, it was never going to make it through. Um, he's just not an extremist and he, and he never will be. So uh, the president would send bills there that he didn't want to have moved. And the same thing was true for uh, Chairman Valario on judiciary in the House. Um, they would send bills there that they didn't want to move that they knew that he wouldn't like. So part of it's knowing, knowing the makeup of the committee and understanding, you know, more or less how, what the likely vote count will be. And part of it's going to be just knowing the chairman and and knowing what kind of bills the chairmen tend to hold and what kind of ones they tend to allow through. So I'm not sure what kind of read he has right now, but the chances of us getting any kind of real tax reform done, I'd say are really slim unless we as a Republican caucus are able to convince our, our new colleagues on the other side why the people of Maryland deserve to have more of their own money. Now, in your short experience down at the House of Delegates, have you gone into a meeting or been pulled aside and some horse trading has gone on or even just a little pep talk, hey, we really need your vote or we need you to vote against this. This is our our bigger plans, that sort of thing. Has that happened to you yet? Um, at, like as a caucus or something? Well, like uh, caucus or, or in, in your committee, have you uh, gone, you know, in chambers and the um, chair, chairman of your committee said, hey, look, I need you to vote this way. I need you to vote that way. Here's why we're going to kill this bill, but support that bill. Has there been any horse trading, any private conversations? Because uh, I know yeah, they not, go on. Yeah, not yet. Not yet. I'm certainly open to them. <laughs> <laughs> if it mm -hmm. means killing bills that are bad, <laughs> right? But so far, so far, there hasn't hasn't really been any backroom dealing done um, that I've been privy to. Um, we've only had, I think, we voted on four bills so far in our in our committee, and one was a split vote where some of the Republicans voted for it and some of the Republicans voted against it. Um, and so I had to come back to our. Um, caucus and the, the ranking member had to come back to the caucus and kind of explain why that happened and, and what was the situation. And then when the when it came to the floor, there were some Republicans that voted for it and some that voted against it. So so that's the only sort of but but other than that, you know, the two that we voted on yesterday, um, we tabled one bill because it was, it was controversial and state's attorneys had not given us a up or down on it. So we wanted to wait till next week. But the other two were um, a party line split in committee. So it was all the Republicans. Oh, actually, it wasn't party line split. I'm sorry. Um, they were they were unanimous. We, we, we all all of us agreed. All Republicans agreed with all the Democrats. And they were I want to say they were just uh, clarifying bills like allowing police officers who are taking somebody Normally, you can get a like write a citation for for certain issues, but but if, if for some reason in the law it was like if the person had committed a a sexual crime against a minor, you could still write them up by citation, and we 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 all agreed that that you should be able to arrest that person, obviously. Mm -hmm. So 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 far, there's not been a lot of backroom dealing. I I'm sure there is some to come, uh, and uh, and I'll. Uh, 
certainly be willing to participate if it means we can get rid of some of the really bad stuff, um, especially some of the new gun restriction bills. Um, I really don't want to see any of those pass. I, I just read that the HBAR ban bill is not going to grandfather in people. I think it's like unless you bought your guns in like, I don't even know, 1991 or something or before that. So it's a gun confiscation bill is what it is. So hopefully that will die a horrible death and never come back out of the drawer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let, let's go back to uh, what the Maryland Taxpayers Association sent out. And um, yeah. Seeks to make Maryland more competitive after loss of Amazon. Virginia, ha Virginia has 22 Fortune 500 companies, while Maryland only has three. I mean, my God. I mean, yeah. Uh, again, are the conversations taking place down in Annapolis? Democrats, Republicans, both parties, whatever the case may be, say, guys, look at this. 22, they have 22, we only have five. Why is that? How can we change that? How can we bring more Fortune 500 companies in and bring more jobs into the state? Yeah, I, I have not heard the conversations happening on the other side of the aisle. Maybe they talk amongst themselves about these issues, but certainly every piece of legislation that I see that has anything to do with taxes or business is only seeking to make, make the state less attractive for businesses. So... I'm not sure what kind of economics books or theories they're working off of, but so far I see big taxes, which further restricts, you know, anybody's interest in coming here, which is really sad. So. Yeah. Um, that's just amazing to me. I mean, you got to have a healthy tax base. You have to have a diversified uh, job base. I mean, I'd like to see somebody do a study on how many jobs are created by military bases in the federal government and what would happen should um, those entities pull out of Maryland. I mean, would that cause a big depression locally? But um, it, it just amazes me how anti-business this state is and, and why the Democrats just don't get it. I don't understand either, honestly. I, I did, it, all, all of their economic viewpoints uh, confuse me and, and it scares me. It's almost like, it's almost like a cult mentality where um, they want something to be true. And if somebody says that it is true, they, they believe it sans actual data or statistics to back it up. It's, it's, it's kind of scary actually. Um, okay. Let, I'm looking up at the letter again and let's see. What else? Firearms, you touched on that. Um, so Senate Bill 536, February 13th, Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs. Prohibits any teacher in state from having a firearm in school. It was a time when public schools taught students to shoot. Some high schools had ranges for that purpose. Many teachers, especially in hunting areas, are very good with firearms. This decision should be left to the counties, not a blanket statewide not a uh, statewide blanket law. Um, what do you think of that? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm usually a, a, not a fan of preemption um, of state and, you know, of local, of local rule. Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes, um, especially with like a lot of the, the gun laws, we sometimes preempt them to prevent the counties or cities from making extreme gun laws that prevent people from owning weapons. So sometimes we do preempt their control. Um, but I really can't stand it when, when the state tries to say you can protect yourself less. It's just totally unacceptable. Yeah. And I grew up in that era where when I was in senior high school, some of the kids had cars were, um, between 16 and 18, didn't graduate until they were 18 or 19. They had gun racks. They brought their shotguns to school. Sometimes yeah. there were deer in the back of their pickup trucks. Um, and we never feared a school shooting. Um, you know, never certainly thought that guns needed to be restricted. In fact, um, I would go the other way that they should teach kids how to shoot and how to handle guns safely. Yeah, I agree. Polly used to have a, a shooting team. Kids would ride the bus 
you know, to school, the city bus with their gun. Yeah. <laughs> with their gun on the bus. Yeah. So and I've told a couple of the Democrats down there that and they are horrified and shocked. They're like, really? And they're from the generation where that what is happening. But they just they just don't know about it or it's so far in the distant past they can't imagine. And so I say things like it's really strange where there was a lot of guns that were literally on the school campus and were in people's lockers, but no shootings at the school. Why do you think that is? And they don't really have a good answer, but they're pretty shocked. So maybe they just haven't been exposed to the fact that um, kids used to literally bring weapons to school and uh, everything was safe back then. So, so something has changed and it wasn't the guns. No, uh, I think one of them was the, the media, which we talk about a lot here on TV, Free Baltimore, and they will highlight something bad to push their own agenda and let's face it the mainstream media is anti-second amendment and um so they'll push that agenda by highlighting something bad and they will not show you know kids maybe being in a a shooting club where they go out to the gun range and shoot the uh, what's it the skeet or whatever the clay pigeons they certainly don't celebrate hunting or fishing um anything that has to do with outdoors and I don't know if if you're old enough to remember, but there was a time when I was growing up when Channel 2 News had Bill Burton on. And he was a fishing guy, but I think the reason that they mainstream media stopped celebrating fishing, because if they go to, let's say, a place called uh, Clyde's Sports Shop, and they go, hey, Clyde, where's the, where's the good fishing at? Well, while you're interviewing Clyde, what do you see in the background? Racks of guns shown in a at least a neutral light, if not a good light, and they're not doing that. So they, they just... You know, just the fact that the fact that we live in the state of Maryland and we've got so many great places to go fishing, and the fact that um, tourism, uh, a lot of some of the tourism that we have is for the hunting and fishing in the, in this state, you would think that Maryland would at least show guns in a neutral light, but instead you've got these politicians that just want to grab, 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 and uh, once again, it's just I think it's just the state moving in the wrong direction. Oh, yeah, it's the whole country. I mean, they they literally believe that all guns are, are bad and that every gun is just one minute away from murdering some innocent victim. That's what they they which is really disorienting, because on the other side of it, a lot of the bills that we're seeing in judiciary are bills that seek to lessen the penalties against people who commit crimes, including crimes with guns. So it's just a really disorienting and disconnected um, thought process. I almost wanted to call it a theology almost. It's literally like a religion. All guns are bad. It's the gun's fault. And then the people that commit the crimes, it's not really their fault. That's that's kind of the feeling that I'm getting when I talk to people um, on the other side of the aisle. They, they feel almost like that the perpetrators of crimes are victims and it's all the weapons fault. It's all the guns fault. It's very bizarre. It's a, it's it's cognitive dissonance at a mass hysteria level. Is is that sort of thought coming from the Baltimore City delegation? I haven't really talked to a lot of people from the Baltimore City delegation about it. Um, but I'm trying to think. I think it's more sort of the Montgomery County, um, some of the Prince George's County. That's that's where a lot of the um, really uncomfortable, very socialist style um, legislation and, and, and ideas are coming from. I haven't really heard a lot of things from Baltimore. I think even the people in Baltimore City are maybe starting to see that the crime has reached a, a fever pitch and they're looking for alternatives. I mean, there's there's been some back back channel discussions amongst my colleagues and I on both sides of the aisle about what can really be done to address the crime in Baltimore City and and will the consent decree really be able to, to, to make improvements uh, down there. And the feeling I got from the other side was that um, they, they don't have any faith that it that it will work either. And um, that it may be at a point where, you know, National Guard may need to get involved and, and clean clean things up down there. So, which, you know, that's pretty shocking to, 
to even hear off the record comments about you know that level of intervention from the state. Um, so that certainly perked my interest. Um, although I'm not sure, I'm not sure I agree that that will that will work because it's not you know, it's so intertwined down there. The the crime is so intertwined with the political structure that I, I honestly don't have a good answer for, for how we can address it and how we can prevent it from spreading out, which is what it's doing, seeping out into the other areas in the county. Oh, you're definitely right. And again, this goes back to the conversation we were having last week that in Baltimore County, inside the Beltway, it feels like, sounds like, looks like, tastes like Baltimore City now. In fact, I was driving on Hartford Road this week in the county, and here comes a guy on an illegal dirt bike. You never saw that before. It's, it's the whole Baltimore City mentality. And, you know, when I was a community advocate down in Baltimore City, the, the thing that I found was that basically the government's not doing the job that only the government can do. Only the police can arrest people, only the prosecutors can prosecute, and only the judges can sentence. And you heard on the news this week that Baltimore City has a, um, a lot of vacancies in the police department because nobody wants to become a cop. And when the cops are continuously beaten down in the press, in the local press, and beaten down by the city state's attorney's office, and uh, just beat down by everybody. Who who wants to go and take a job there? You know, I mean, you you go, you you take that job. It's dangerous to begin with, and then you have everybody Monday morning quarterbacking what you're doing on the streets. You make the wrong arrest in the wrong way. Not only is your career done, but you could end up in jail. Who the hell wants that kind of job? Okay, but that's what the politicians in Baltimore City want. They they do not want law and order in Baltimore City, and it, and then you've got prosecutors that when you go into any proceeding, court proceeding down in Baltimore City, the first thing they do, you walk in, they start the, the day's court proceedings, and uh, you just hear the judge up there going, case dismissed, case dismissed, no pros, no pros, no pros, no pros, no pros. So you've got these people in this revolving door in the city's courthouses, and they end up having these outrageously long records, 20 feet long, 30 feet, up to 60 feet long, because they're not prosecuted. And then if they are prosecuted, okay, if you can get the prosecutors to prosecute, particularly on drug charges, because uh, most liberals believe that all drugs should be legalized, then the judges, instead of putting them, these drug dealers away, they just give them probation. And then you and I have talked about um, violation of probation hearings where you have these drug dealers, they get arrested, they are, in fact, prosecuted. They're found guilty. They're placed on probation. Six weeks later, arrested for the exact same thing on the exact same street corner. Then they go before a judge for their, to see if they violated their probation on the charge that they are found guilty on. And the judge just says, dismissed. And so you've got this population down there that the government is not doing only what the government can do. A private citizen can't take a drug dealer off the corner and say, hey, I'm going to lock you up in my basement for 18 months. Can't do that. So if you've got a political system that aren't making the arrest they should, prosecutors that aren't prosecuting because they believe that drugs should be legal, you know, I mean, we just had um, the state's attorney in Baltimore City saying, uh, we're not going to prosecute uh, pot charges anymore. Well, guess what? They're also doing that with heroin. They're doing that with uh, every drug imagined. And when somebody comes into court that's a dealer, they say, oh, he's really just an addict, Your Honor. He, he, needs, he needs help. He's not a drug dealer. Meanwhile, you look at his arrest record, and the guy's been arrested 30 times for dealing drugs. So it's, it's people in positions of power and influence that don't want to use the strong arm of the government to create a society where the needs of the law-abiding trump the needs of criminals. And you hear all kinds of goofy stuff like, well, um, there's a guy on the corner dealing drugs, but let's not call the police because we don't want that guy to have a criminal record because if he has a criminal record, he won't be able to apply for a job. As if the guy got up in the morning, put 20 resumes in the mailbox, and it's just dealing drugs until he gets his job at uh, Bethel, uh, you know, Black and Decker. 
That's not what's going on. These are not good guys that are sending resumes out and are just victims of circumstances and are going to quit their evil deeds as soon as they get an, an economic opportunity like uh, Black & Decker. These, this is not what's going on, but this is what you hear when you talk to the people in Baltimore City. And then if they do get arrested, if the police do pick them up, well, we don't want to prosecute them because they may end up in jail. And if they end up in jail, we want to keep them out of jail so they don't join gangs. Guess what? They're already in a gang. <laughs> so it's just the mentality of the people that are in positions of power and influence down there that is the reason why Baltimore City's full of crime. So even if you brought in the National Guard, it may calm things down to a certain bit. But until the judges do their job, particularly the ones in the violation probation hearings, until they say, I'm going to violate your probation, I've seen you six times this year, you're going away for 10 years, until, they, until the violation probation judges in particular start doing their job, the city's doomed, whether you bring in the National Guard or not. I know. That's, that's exactly right. That's exactly how I feel as well. Yeah. I was like, I see why you guys would ask for that, but it's not going to work because the problem is not just happening in the police department, trust me. It's at all the levels that you just described, and it's yeah. not an easy fix. The the um, the police are not the problem. The criminals are the problem. Okay, so go after the people that are causing the trouble, uh, the problems. Okay, because if you don't do that, people that have the capability of packing it up and leaving, they're leaving the city. Okay, they're leaving, and they've been leaving for quite some time, and. Also, another thing you hear in Baltimore City is, well, the city's depopulating because racist white people want to, don't want to live with black people. You know, that may have been true like 50 years ago. That is not what's going on now. The people that are leaving now are leaving because of the high crime and the high taxes and the low quality of life. And until the people running the city get that, and until the people that are in government start doing their job, it's, the this, this city's just going to continue to be a failed state. Yeah, totally. I mean, a lot of my friends that moved down there did so because they were looking for diversity. They wanted their kids to grow up in a in a diverse community where there was lots of different um, backgrounds and cultures and, and colors of people. And they're leaving now because only because of the crime and because of of the dysfunction of the school system. So it's it's certainly not because they don't want to have neighbors that are that are different colors than them. It, it's because they wish they could live there. It's because the, the crime is so out of control. It doesn't feel safe. And, uh, and they're not wrong. It, it isn't safe. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't live there and I wouldn't buy property there. It's, it's sad. It's very just what happened. Yeah. Uh, buying rental property in Baltimore city was probably the biggest mistake I, I made in my life. I would never do it again. Yeah. The, um, the government is against people like me. I know the, the, the self starters, the small business guys, the the house painters, the electricians that live down there that are law abiding, that live in a particular block. They don't care about them. They care about the guy that's going out on the corner dealing drugs. And oh my God, he's such a victim. We we can't arrest yeah. him. We can't prosecute him. We can't. Meanwhile, that's where most of your violence comes from. Right. It's you know the the drug dealers shooting uh, other drug dealers over. Uh, Evil money. I know. That's almost all of it. Almost every bit of the crimes. I mean, I just got a paper sent to me f about uh, gun crimes in Maryland, and they're all they're all from handguns. So all of the rules, they try to ban long guns and, and ban different types of rifle, rifles. Those were never hurting people. All, all of the crime is happening from handguns, and it's almost exclusively happening in, in drug-related situations. So, yeah, there's... There's no way through through legislation, you know, we're going to be able to solve what's what's going on. Although, you know, there is a bill to put the judge's names on Maryland case search. It's done inconsistently now. It's not required. So uh, I put my name on a bill to to make them put the names of the judges on line so that everybody can see you know, who are the judges that are null processing every single pro, you know, probation, pro, parole and probation violation. We as a community have a right to know who these people are that are making the crime worse instead of making it better. Yeah. Every time 
a judge null process a case. It's like playing Russian roulette with public safety and you're just putting another one in the six shooter. Eventually all, all six holes are filled and you end up with what you have in Baltimore City. Um, and it's a shame. It, it's really, it really is. It's, um, it's a liberal paradise and, the, and it just frightens me that Baltimore County is going in the same direction. And if you go inside the Beltway, from the city line inside the Beltway, like I said, I mean, I'm there almost every day and it's just, it's just, you know, you see more, more people begging for money. Like I said last week, you go up to your local grocery store, as soon as you come out, you're accosted by three to four junkies begging for money. Um, you know, small businesses are going out of business and it's, it's not a good situation. So. No, no. Did you see the new green deal? From Orcadio no, Cortez, it literally no. says, uh, "I want to. I don't want to mess the wording up." It says something about how there needs to be an income for everyone who is unable or unwilling to work. Hey, I'm all for that because I want to be the first guy in line. Okay, <laughs> I want to get my money, and I'm just going to drink all day. What oh kind of society goodness. would we have then? It would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and instead, be. you know, and these Democrats, I can't believe they want to make the minimum wage $15. Let's just make it a million dollars a year because I want to be a millionaire. I know. You know? So do I. Any day so now. If, imagine what our economy would look like if everybody got a, a million dollars. I know what it would look like because uh, <laughs> they tried that in Iran. And it looked like you had to import all of your, you know, employees from other from other countries. They literally just uh, had to bring everybody in from outside because nobody... Nobody wanted to be a doctor anymore. Why would you? You're a millionaire now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I, I don't get it. And you know what we're talking about right now? What we're joking around. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, get TV Free Baltimore uh, up and running and out there, so that people could come and at least hear free market arguments, right? Instead of what you hear on the mainstream media. I mean, like, like I said last week, when the Democrats unveiled their uh, legislative agenda for Annapolis this year. The news that I was watching was like, oh, my God, this is great. This is brilliant. Fifteen dollars an hour. And, and and when no matter which uh, news outlet I go to locally, they're talking about that like it's a great idea. And it, it just amazes me how we're supposed to be a, a free country, but everybody's talking against freedom. I know. I know. No, I, I think at this point, a giant chunk of our electorate has decided that freedom is overrated, freedom of speech, uh, a free market, free business, uh, and they've moved to, if the government can just control it the right way, it'll be better for everybody, which is horrifying because we absolutely know that that is not true. I mean, many of the countries in Europe that Ocasio-Cortez um, singles out as some of the most you know, effective countries, the best socialist countries, they have no minimum wage laws at all. So it's just a disconnect with reality, a disconnect with um, the market always wins. I, I've said this to many people, the market always wins. If you think that you've regulated an industry to, to functionality, what you've done is you've made the ethical people get out of that industry and you've concentrated the power into the hands of those who are the least ethical. And that, that is, I think, for either party, not the direction that we want to be going. Yeah, I think a lot of people just don't want to be responsible for their own existence. And they think that if the government acted like a parent and just provided them with everything, that they wouldn't have to worry anymore. And, um, oh boy, what a society would have if people didn't have to be responsible for themselves and uh, just told the government, okay, you take care of me. It, it's It's... You know, we, we have to continually stress self-reliance. We have to stress, you know, that whole American mentality of going out west and, and settling the land and working hard and, and this stuff about, you know, guaranteed income. Because somebody's got to pay for it. And eventually, and this may have already happened, you're going to take away the, incent the incentive to work. And if people don't want to work because they can't get ahead... It, it's it's just moving completely in the wrong direction. 
I know. I know. I, I agree. I don't know what happened to us or how I, I mean, it, I think it's been, it's been worked on through the public school system for the last 50, 60 years. They've been so, you know, slowly deteriorating the concept of American exceptionalism, the concept of, um, you know, with, with, uh, you know, hard work, you get great reward. Um, and they've replaced it with this concept of equality where everyone, everyone should not have an equal chance but should have an equal outcome right and equal outcome. yeah that is not that's not real no. and and people think that it's real and it simply isn't i mean if you look at the countries where um there is true socialism there is such a differentiation between the haves and the have-nots it's it makes your hair stand on end. I mean, it's like a couple of billionaires and everybody else is living in poverty and yeah. there is no middle class. It is, mm -hmm. you know, it is the government and those that are connected to it have millions and millions and millions of dollars at their disposal and everybody else is hungry and eating their cat. So yeah. it's it's scary that, that people don't realize you can't tinker with the market and expect and expect it to work out well for even the vast majority of people. It, it will be a lot of suffering. And that's, that's what you see in places like Venezuela. Yeah. This whole, um, equality of outcome is crap. And I think the government instead should look out to make sure that the game is fair. And, you know, we talked about this last week, particularly with mortgages, you buy a house, you take a 30 year mortgage out, you pay on it faithfully for 20 years, you lose your job. You know, how about making things to where you call the bank and say, look, I've had the house for 20 years. Give me one month per year that I've owned the house. And the bank should just freeze the mortgage for 20 months and give you 20 months to get your act together instead of starting foreclosure the 91st day after your last payment. And, you know, to me, that's rigging the game in favor of the little guy in the name of fairness. But you don't sit there and say, well, you know, you got a house. But that other guy that's renting doesn't have a house, so we're going to tax you to the point that where we, the government can provide a house for somebody else. Equality of outcome, that's, that's dangerous. And I also think that a lot of people in politics, they simply they want power. They, they want to feed their ego. They want to get dressed up in their Sunday best. They want to go down to places like Washington and Annapolis and feel important, all this kind of stuff. So that what they do is um, they'll take a situation where they say, okay, you have a God-given right to own a gun, okay, which is fine and illegal, but it's not legal to murder somebody. So if somebody gets murdered by a gun, I'm going to feel important by saying it's gun violence and let's ban guns. You know, meanwhile, um, like in Baltimore City, the, it's not really gun violence, it's drug violence. But they don't want to even identify the problem correctly. They want to feel important and say, well, let's ban guns. So let's let's take something away from somebody. Um, so th th that's the way that I see it. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's sort of the new modus operandi of of heavy-handed government in our country is that um, they they just want to you know whatever the me mainstream media will pick up and spin positive. That's the policy that they support, whether or not it harms you know the, even themselves. I mean they're. What was that New York, uh, or maybe it was Chicago, a Chicago councilman or something? He had an office full of weapons, and he was one of the big anti-gun guys. He had like 20 guns in his freaking office. And yeah. then there was a, a, a senator or a delegate in California, huge guy that was all about um, anti-gun, guns are dangerous, guns kill people. He was literally selling guns on the black market and is now going to prison. It, I mean, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Good for thee, not for me. That's that's politics today in America, and uh, yeah. and a lot of it's electorates that are uninformed and and simply don't don't know how to stop it from happening. Yeah, and and that's a good reason for people to keep up on what's going on uh, locally. Don't don't depend on your press to bring things to light. You know. Take a look around, see what's going on. Absolutely. But, um, read the bills. They're all online. And there are synopses of them all, all online. You can read every single, every single one of them. 
Yeah, and I'm going to give you uh, an interesting uh, story here, and it's about gun control. When I was finishing up college, so this would be in maybe 94, I um, was in my last semester of college, I was doing an internship down in Annapolis working for Senator Leo Green. Now, he was a co-sponsor of the gun ban. So he had, he had, all, he had all these uh, constituents writing in, I'm against the gun ban, don't, don't vote for the gun ban, and all this kind of business. So I was the guy that answered the letters. Um, and, but I'd have to let the senator read them before he signed them. So he told me, he's like, look, just write a letter up that says, thank you for your opinion. I will take your opinion into consideration before I voted on this bill, right? Meanwhile, he's a co-sponsor of the bill. I mean, literally lying to his constituents as if he hasn't made his mind up yet. And I was like, Senator, if you believe in this gun ban, why don't you be man enough to say, I'm a co-sponsor of this bill, and here's why. He would not do that. So... You even have to be suspicious of your elected officials. And the best way to get around this, and, and he had, I don't know, maybe 375 people write in against the gun ban. Of the 375, I remember one that just wrote in, send me a copy of the bill from the legislative office so I can see who co-sponsors it. Out of, like one out of 375 knew the knew where to look to, to find out that he had co-sponsored the bill. And then once we sent them that, I mean, the senator was even thinking about having me white out his name on the bill that we sent this guy. I was like, you can't do that. I mean, there's got to be some, a little bit of honesty here. If, you, if, if you're a Democrat that believes in banning guns or co-sponsoring a bill, at least be honest about it. Don't tell people why I haven't decided. I'm going to think about it. Thank you for your opinion. Um, so, you know, if, if you're viewing this, TV Free viewers, and you really want to see what's going down in Annapolis, don't. Just take your elected official's word for it. Get a copy of the bill. See who's co-sponsoring it. Um, what's that? Yeah, I, I, I can't hear you. I think, I think we lost your audio. Yeah. Oh, here, wait a minute, you're back. But um, well, what do you think about that story? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think we've lost you. So let, let's just end that. Let, let's end it today with that little story. But um, yeah, TV absolutely. Free, yeah, TV free viewers, um, inform yourself. Inform yourself. This is my jump shot. Fastball, I need to play. Everybody wins. Let me show you how to play. When you pick up some trash, and it's a ball, and then you throw it in the bucket, you're playing a trash ball. A jump shot hook, you gotta put it away. We're gonna play that trash ball every day. Come on, Bomber, play We're ball play and keep ball it clean. The Despotil is on my shore. Maryland, my Maryland, his torch is at thy temple door. Maryland, my This concludes another day of live stream broadcasting from TV Free Baltimore.